Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. With me is Mr. Big Pot Energy, Andrew Erickson, off of Big Sugar High from Friday's show. We all know that. It's Derek Brown, D-Bro, the king of bros, who is also a boomer, I found out this weekend, who still does not have <laughs> to work. He has no idea how to work a Google Share Drive, but we talked him through it. Everything is okay now. He also had a little problem setting up his camera today. There was a lot of things going on, but we got Grandpa here on the show today, and I'm very excited about it because today, today we're going to talk a little best ball because that's what season we're in. We're in best ball season. We're in that time where we're taking shots, where we think we're all the smartest people in the room, and maybe we are, maybe we're not, but at least the guys have identified some risers and fallers today that you need to be aware of in terms of your ranks, where you have people, where you want to select guys, because best ball is a great way to make a lot of money. And uh, last year, I got to tell you, boys, right this time of year, off of all the panic from the Aaron Rodgers, is he going to go? Is he going to stay? Panic that kind of swept the nation. Joey P did not panic. No, no, no. Joey P went out there and drafted Devontae Adams, Aaron Rodgers, and uh, Aaron Jones and every Green Bay Packer he could on the cheap in best ball and made some money. And maybe today we'll get you those names as well. But if you need some extra help, we've got our best ball draft kit available at fantasypros.com slash best ball. That's the place to go. So fantasypros.com slash best ball. We've got our complete best ball draft kit available for you. It's got ADP. It's got rankings updated by the guys almost every day. It feels like the draft strategies, the roster construction advice, everything that you need to be successful for all your best ball drafts. And if you are a subscriber and go premium today on Fantasy Pros, you get a whole other plethora. And you know, plethora means a lot of more information in that best ball draft kit. So we're giving some away for free, but not the whole thing. So make sure if you are really serious about best ball that you subscribe to Fantasy Pros as a premium member. Also, when you become a premium member, you get to hang out with us and talk to us, ask us questions about whatever you like in our Discord at fantasypros.com slash chat. Now that also, free to join, amazing, super fun, but when you are a premium member of Fantasy Pros, you can hang out in our AMA channels, you can hang out with us in Stages. Stages is amazing because we have legitimate conversations back and forth about your teams and work through stuff. It's so much better than asking us a Twitter question. It's so much deeper. And if you're a serious fantasy football player, you need to be with us at Fantasy Pros for the tools, the access we give you, and we have an amazing community, and that is true. And it's all headed up by our grandpa here, Derek Brown. Now, grandpa, I don't know if you saw this uh, at the, the weekend or not, but uh, Jarvis Landry uh, signed with your New Orleans Saints. So I, I assume you had to put your glasses on so you could read the uh, the blurb from Fantasy Pros News about it. But when you did... I want to know what your gut reaction is because we were waiting for Jarvis Landry to land somewhere. There were rumors about other spots. And how does this Landry signing affect Chris Olave specifically in this uh, first year of his rookie season? Well, we're not even five minutes into the show and shots have been fired. People have chose violence on today's show. And um, apparently people are talking about themselves in the third person. So, but anyway, about mm -hmm. Jarvis Landry, um, I, it doesn't move the needle much for me, Joe. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I think it's interesting and it shows maybe like they're adding more skill players to this offense and that the passing rights might, might surprise a little bit considering how run heavy and how slow this offense was last year. So small uptick for Jameis Winston, maybe. Uh, but if, as far as Jarvis Landry, I mean, look, whether he was going to be in Cleveland or other scenarios, he hasn't been a very efficient player over the last few seasons. I think ranking him over being like a back end wide receiver four, top end wide receiver five is probably a little bit too rich. So I, it doesn't give him a massive value boost for me because you do still have Chris Olave. Uh, Alvin Kamara is still probably the second target in this passing attack. But I think it's interesting from what it can mean from the offense as a whole. All right, Andrew, uh, any love for Landry or any concern for Olave? No, no concern for Olave for me. I think that when you just look at the skill sets of the players, I mean, Landry at this point, his career is an underneath, you know, target receiver. Like he's not going to be taking the top off the defense. Like it's pretty clear, like Olave is going to be the big play guy down the field when they decide to do it in New Orleans. So I feel pretty, I didn't really move the needle with Chris Olave again, like from a target perspective, like sure, like Landry could eat into his target share, but I don't think that Olave was necessarily walking into a massive target share with if, if Michael Thomas is coming back healthy and really, I think the play with Jarvis Landry is, is Michael Thomas healthy? Like that's really the question mm -hmm. mark here. Does this mean, does the signing indicate that they're 
more concerned? Is it insurance? Because Jarvis Landry, when all these guys are healthy, okay, yeah, he's probably not really re fantasy relevant. But if Michael Thomas, you take his 30% target share out of this offense and you put in a guy like Jarvis Landry, who has been known to suck up targets. I mean, last year when he was healthy on the field, 25% target rate per out run. That was top 12 in the NFL. So I don't think that Landry is washed in any way. I mean, he's not 30 years old yet, so he's still got time, you know, at that crisp 29 years old, and a little bit younger than me, actually. Uh, so I think that Jarvis Landry is someone that I think in best ball is kind of interesting as an arbitrage playoff of, okay, well, I don't think Michael Thomas is going to recapture what he was once in 2019 or even 2020 uh, when he was healthy. So I think that there is a path, but obviously I think it costs, it needs some injuries uh, for Jarvis Landry to really hit his ceiling because he was pretty effective last year when in the two, actually the last two years when Odell Beckham Jr. was hurt. Like that's when we actually saw mm -hmm. Landry actually right. produce. And uh, yes, his efficiency has fallen off, but look, I mean, we saw with Baker Mayfield, it wasn't like he was, he was really helping a lot of his receivers most of the time. So I think that Landry is an interesting piece to, to add to New Orleans. Good stuff, gentlemen. Good answers. I accept both of them. Very nice. Well done. <laughs> Let's go to the best ball risers. Let's start on a positive note. Talk about the guys. We're moving up our rankings because we like some of the things their teams have done so far this offseason or with the draft or even some recent news that we've received. Let's start with the quarterback position and Derek Brown. You've got a quarterback that you have moved up your rankings in best ball. Who is it? I mean, I, I keep we we talked about this the last time we were on this podcast. I, how high can I get Jalen Hurts? Because I keep pushing him up, guys. I mean, I got him at QB four right now, and a lot of people like he is getting really really high in my ranks. But I think it's all deserved. AJ Brown arriving into this offense is massive, and even if you look at Hurts, and they always point back to well, Hurts is not a great passer. Okay. He showed massive improvement as the year went on last year. So over the final six games, he was 16th, uh, the 16th highest graded PFF passer, 15th in adjusted completion rate, and 13th in deep ball completion percentage. And you add in the rushing, which the ankle injury down the stretch really hurt him. We saw his rushing yards per game drop from 56 to 29. I think that he has got massive upside. And as aggressive as I'm ranking him, which... I know a lot of people have him ranked as QB5, QB6. I think that there is a world where Jalen Hurts, considering especially because the passing touchdown rate wasn't high last year, guys. Like, you're looking at all quarterbacks with 20 or 200 or more passing attempts. Hurts was 23rd in passing touchdown rate. So mm -hmm. if we get the marriage of all these different things, if the rushing remains, if A.J. Brown helps their passing rate go up, the passing touchdowns, if all of these stars align – we could see a Lamar Jackson type of like he just dominates fantasy football. And that's the type of upside, because if that happens, I want to be above consensus on Jalen Hurts, because if that happens, you're going to win a lot of money in best ball with him on your squads. I was going to say, it makes a lot more sense. It feels like to have him if you're going to have him high somewhere, have him high in best ball, because mm -hmm. that would seem to be the best spot for him because of all the upside. And that's what you're looking for in best ball. You're looking for the upside play. He is the ECR QB six on fantasy pros in the best ball rankings. You've got him at four 52 overall. So a little bit higher and look, you make some good points there at the end about uh, how at the end of the season, he did come on and make some improvements. So we'll see how far they want to push that ball downfield. Erickson, do you have a quarterback that you've moved up in your best ball rankings recently? Yes, yeah, so I've moved up Jameis Winston for the New Orleans Saints because look, looking back at last year, he really didn't have much to work with, but in his limited sample size, he was really efficient. I know they weren't really passing a lot, but 17.5 fantasy points per game, that was QB 14 on average for Jameis Winston. And you don't need to spend a lot of draft capital to draft Jameis Winston in best ball. Like mm -hmm. you can get him as a back end QB two. And you need to have quarterbacks that are going to start weeks. Like you can't take zeros at the position. And we're starting to see the Saints offense and the Saints team tell us that we think we can win this year. We think that we can be competitive from all the moves that they've made. And I mean, it's not just one improvement that he has in this offense from last year. It's multiple guys that they're adding. Chris Olave, Jarvis Landry, Michael Thomas, like none of those guys were there last year. <laughs> he had no one to throw up to except for Marquez Calloway, my guy, Deontay Harris, like just like guys that you would see as wide receiver four or <laughs> fives on every other NFL team. And, and despite that, Winston was again, like I said, QB 14 points per game, lowest turnover worthy play rate, 3% of his career and sixth highest passer rating. So yeah, I don't expect his efficiency to necessarily carry over because like Debro had mentioned, Maybe we see them throw the ball a little bit more. 
Jameis Winston maybe kind of showed, hey, you can trust me a little bit more. I'm not going to turn the ball over as much. And I mean, if they want to be competitive, you can't just run the football and play defense in the NFL. Like we all know that, like you're going to have to throw the ball to win games. And the Saints are telling us that they want to go win games this year. So I think that's good for Jameis Winston. And again, it wasn't that long ago that we saw Jameis Winston be a top tier fantasy quarterback. And the fact that Mm -hmm. he's that he's capable of doing it. It's like similar to how I think about Matthew Stafford. We all know Matthew Stafford had it in him. He just kind of needed to put the right pieces around him. and He could take a massive leap. So Winston, I have as my quarterback 20 and he's going way later than that in in best ball. So in best ball drafts, my only thing with that is he had the right pieces around him in Tampa because Tom Brady showed up and they won a Super Bowl. He was top five quarterback. So the right, the right pieces were there. I mean, I, I would say that New Orleans almost is a downgrade of pieces, it feels like, from Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, the way things are gone. But I do like the Landry addition as insurance for this best ball movement that you've got of Winston. So actually, I'm on board with this. I like it. I approve again. Stamp of approval. There you go. You got it again. Let's go for another guy from Debro's list. Who's a riser for you uh, for best ball so far right now in the month of May? I mean, it's a guy that I think a lot of people, now that we're trying to marinate on the NFL draft, they're down on. And I'm buying into Chase Claypool. We saw the early career efficiency. His yards per route run was fantastic in his rookie season. We saw a dip in the sophomore season. But as a guy, you're not having to pay a massive cost for. And really, the the question I'm trying to answer with this and where I think Claypool could take a big leap is he could play the power slot role in Pittsburgh this year. We're all saying, okay, well, they have Pickens, they have Deontay Johnson, Calvin Austin. Who's going to play the slot? I think it's going to be Chase Claypool right now, and if that's going to be the case, you're talking about a mismatch from the word go. We know the size and speed, and if you look at uh, how he and Deontay Johnson perform in the slot— I mean, this could be a huge leap for Chase Claypool. Last year, amongst all wide receivers with 10 or more slot targets, he was 29th in slot yards per route run. You compare that versus Deontay Johnson, I mean, it's, it was a pretty big difference, guys, like 1.77 to 1.0. So, and to give some extra context to that, like his his yards per route run from the inside was higher than DJ Moore and Jerry Judy. And as a guy that also he was creating when he was inside, creating big plays, he was 16th in yards after catch per reception. And that was right behind Odell Beckham Jr. So if we're looking at a role that gives Chase Claypool big upside in scheming easy targets for Kenny Pickett or whoever's under center, I think it's going to be Pickett, but it is going to be also a boon for Pickett because and I wrote this up. If you head over to the Dynasty Draft Kit in my profile for Kenny Pickett, He had massive splits at Pitt over his entire career when he was throwing towards the middle of the field versus pushing it outside the numbers. So I think all this sets up versus skill set, mismatch, and being a boom for Kenny Pickett that Chase Klupel, if he plays the power slot position, man, we could see him take off. Here's a question for you. Do you like Claypool more in best ball than you do in just regular redraft play? I think it's a kind of a wash. I mean, I think if you're chasing the ceiling, then I probably do lean to him in best ball formats just versus probably where he's going in drafts. If there's a format where I'm going to be above consensus, it probably does lean itself to best ball more than other uh, formats. Well, also because if you think about it, I mean, he's been this guy who's had explosive, enormous games and then kind of gone to sleep some other times, statistically speaking, you know, I mean, we can all argue about the reasons why, but I mean, it's facts are facts. So to me, that best ball version of Claypool, when he has those great days, boy, he can really carry it forward. You have him as wide receiver 43, ECR is at 46, so not too much higher than the consensus, but you make a lot of good points. I feel like the bloom is off the rose a little bit with him. Erickson, let's go back to you for another one of your risers. Who's next on your list for best ball rising? Running back James Connor for the Arizona Cardinals because I just don't understand like how you can still draft him in round three uh, of best ball drafts. I drafted him round three today. I'm gonna draft him round three tomorrow, and I'm gonna <laughs> keep doing it till he moves up the ranks because there's no reason he shouldn't be a top ten consensus running back across the board, whether versus an ECR or an ADP. Chase Edmonds is gone. They don't have anyone else in that backfield that's gonna garner for touches. Eno Benjamin is a third down back. Keontae Ingram was a seventh round pick. Jalen Samuels is a cast off from the Pittsburgh Steelers who used to play tight end. It's like th- there's no one else in that backfield that's going to garner touches away from James Conner. And I get that people are concerned about, okay, like the injuries, obviously. But dude, like look at the running backs in the first round. Dalvin Cook, oh, injuries. Oh, McCaffrey, oh, injuries. Derrick Henry, oh, he got hurt last year too. Like they're all 
have some type of injury risk associated with them. And James Conner is the one that is the one that's discounted the most. So I'm going to continue to scoop mm-hmm. him up. If you look at him last year without Edmonds, six games, his finishes, RB1, RB16, RB8, RB11, RB2, and RB3. Um, yeah, I'm going to take him outside in round three all day, every day. And you've got him right now as the RB9 in your rankings. How how much of a variance is there between that and the consensus right now? Did you remember offhand? I think that it he's seems going like, as like RB15. Like he's, yeah, not say, even he's more viewed. like 14 or 50. Yeah, yeah. that's that's absurd. He's, yeah, uh, Especially I, I when know. you consider the usage and the need for that team to run him right now. Yeah, and there's no Hopkins. I know Debro had mentioned that when we first covered the Hopkins suspension. But who's going to get the red zone touches? Like they're just going to give it to James Conner. It's going to be Kyler Murray running it in. So right. I, I think that Conner is just I I don't I don't get it. Look, I I think the reason is the injury history. But you make a very good point, which is <laughs> like, so what? There, there like, they are, all have injury history. Injury guys. They all have injury risk. That's What's everybody. <laughs> right. Well, you might as well. Well, look, it's been co- well. There's some guys more than others. But in all fairness, he's coming off a healthy season. He's coming off a year or two where now all of a sudden Chase Edmonds has left the backfield. So he's got more opportunity there for him alone. There will be some other guys sprinkling in there, I'm sure. But still, um, and if, God forbid, Kyler Murray doesn't show up on time, who knows <laughs> what's going to go on there. All right, let's go back to you, D-Bro. Give me another one of your risers for best ball that you've got so far. Well, we talked about a current Cardinal. I'll go with a former. And Christian Kirk, I know that there's been a lot of shade about the massive contract that he got. But also, this pretends like... He's going to get targets in Jacksonville. And if you look at where he's ranked, he's currently ECR wide receiver 42. I've got him ranked as a top 36 wide receiver right now. I think the target volume is going to be there. Who's he competing against? Uh, Marvin Jones and Zay Jones? Zay Jones. Yeah. Yeah. All the Joneses. He's got to keep up with the Joneses in order to get that job. Yeah. I mean, exactly, man. And like, here's the thing. Christian Kirk, and I think that... (sighs) The, Arizona putting him in the slot last year was fantastic versus him playing outside. He was 28th in slot yards per route run last year, 121 passer rating, which is right ahead of Debo Samuel when he was targeted. I think that he's a guy that, what are we saying? Like, he's got a floor of 110, 100, maybe 15, 120 targets right now mm-hmm. in Jacksonville. And really, this is going to help out Trevor Lawrence, especially because 29% of his attempts were in the short, middle, and intermediate parts of the field. Christian Kirk was the, damn, he was 22nd ranked uh, graded wide receiver on intermediate targets per PFF. I think this is going to be a massive help for Lawrence. And if that's the case, he could just start peppering him with targets because he's like, who the hell else am I throwing the ball to? Maybe Travis Etienne and a bunch of scrubs on the outside. You make a good case. Uh, It's funny because Christian Kirk, when that contract happened, my reaction, I think, was similar to everybody, which is, wow, that's really sort of eye opening. And then we start to dig into the deeper metrics of him as a receiver last year. There was a lot to like, and it it reeked of a a, a metric signing like the, the Jaguars went out and said, "Okay, statistically speaking, when you dig into the numbers, who would be a really good investment? And then they overpaid for a player who really hasn't performed like a star. But if he does perform like a star, I don't think anyone's going to be laughing about this contract at the end of this time next year, forget it. Everybody was like, wow, what, look at what geniuses the Jacksonville Jaguars were. Now, I know that's a hard thing to say, genius and Jaguar in the same sentence. We don't get that very often, but uh, a lot of good uh, pieces there, a lot of good stat nuggets. Also, wide receiver 34 is where Debro has him. He's wide receiver 42. This is a pretty big variance here, but I like it. I'm with you, Derek. I think that he's got a, a lot of upside in this format uh, and might be the go-to guy. Let's get a wide receiver from you, Erickson. Who you got who's rising up your best ball ladder? Yeah, so so this player is on the Green Bay Packers, and I've, I've done a lot of thinking about, you know, who do I want, who do I think can really emerge from this, this Packers receiving corpse? With Aaron Rodgers, and what's the biggest thing with Rodgers is you're looking for a guy that has... was that a was that a Freudian slip when you said corpse because corpse? I think it's core, but it does God. feel like that room is dead right now. So I'm yeah. just asking. Is that yeah, a no, bit no, of that's, that's what I meant to do. A little bit of both. Uh, uh, I tried uh-huh. to do that okay. on purpose. All right, so go ahead. Keep going. I'm looking for a player that, that Rodgers trusts, <laughs> and I think that's Alan Lazard to an extent. I think that Lazard has shown over the years that he stepped up when other guys have gone down. He had a hundred yard game in 2020 when Devonte adams got hurt and if you look at he, what he did towards the end of last season wide receiver eight in ppr scoring 21 receptions for 290 receiving yards and five touchdowns like what is Devonte adams biggest role in this offense has been touchdown production and usage in the red mm-hmm. zone alan lazard is six foot five like he is a big body wide receiver that aaron Rodgers trusts in the red zone and he showed us that he trusts him 
last sure. year when he caught five touchdowns, like down if during a five game stretch. So Lazard's at a point where he's not super expensive. Like he's still going outside of the the top 40 wide receivers, but he is building as people are starting to kind of realize like, look, like, yes, Christian Watson is the, the sexy new toy as the rookie receiver with all this athleticism. But I mean, let's think about this. Like is, is Rogers really going to trust a rookie receiver that has coming in with some potential focus drop issues with some raw to it, rawness to his game? Do we really think that, oh yeah, Aaron Rodgers is going to be like, yep, that's my number one receiver. I'm not going to, that's what I'm going to lock in on. I just think that's, I don't know. I, I think Watson, it might be a year two thing for them and not necessarily a guy that I'm going to over invest in, in redraft leagues and dynasty is obviously a different conversation, but I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we thought Nikhil Harry landing with Tom Brady was an awesome landing spot and it was horrible. And it wasn't because they just didn't mesh and it could just simply be a veteran quarterback. Doesn't want to target a rookie receiver because he doesn't know his assignments. Whereas Alan Lazard, has done everything that the Packers want, has done everything Aaron Rodgers has want to earn his trust. So I think he's being a little bit undervalued, and he's someone that I've been moving up my rankings as I've kind of, kind of turned a corner on trying to really figure out and peg who I want to target in this Packers receiving room. Well, it's a thin room. Uh, yes. You've got him at 46. I Right now, Alan Lazard in the consensus is wide receiver 48. You know who's 49? Christian Watson. Does that surprise you how close they are back to back? No, I, I I think that people are are hedging to an extent because they're not exactly <laughs> sure like where in I mean I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but you know if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I'm trying to put myself in his. If I'm you know under center for the Green Bay Packers, taking those snaps, and I'm Rodgers, I'm probably looking for the guy that I've trusted over the past couple of years, someone that I invited to Thanksgiving dinner. Can't forget that Alan Lazard and Aaron Rodgers shared a turkey once upon a time. So unless we see Christian Watson at brunch with Aaron Rodgers, I'm just a little bit hesitant to get on him in redraft for year one. Sam Howell will never. Brunch. <laughs> Sam yeah, Howell Sam never. Howell's not going. He's getting that tofu <laughs> what does he turkey. Eat at he's got that tofu turkey. <laughs> he's got the tofu turkey. Well, no, he said he eats chicken, so it just they make him a roast chicken. There you go. I'm not a big turkey guy myself. I'd rather have the roast chicken anyway. But I digress. Let's go to another one of your guys, Debro. Who you got in the rising column in best ball drafts right now in your ranks? So before I get to this next player, I want to give Erickson a little bit more love on Lazard. I love that call. And when I looked into the deeper numbers about Rodgers and Lazard, fantastic. I think that he is going to take a massive leap because Rodgers loves to pepper the short part of the fields. Um, mm -hmm. Like over the last three seasons, 13th, 8th, and 13th in targets zero to nine yards for the line of scrimmage. And Lazard has been fantastically efficient. Like his yards per route run within nine yards of the line of scrimmage. His ranks over the last three years, guys, 25th, first and seventh. So love the Lazar call. Um, if we're looking for other spots of efficiency and players that have a massive ceiling. Why is everybody continuing to sleep on David Ajoku? Like, I, I don't really understand it. I have him as my tight end eight, uh, 88th overall versus ECRs at tight end 14 and 127th. This is a guy like we're looking at opportunities and everybody's kind of talking about David Bell and, and who's going to step forward. DPJ, we know, is not that guy. David Bell, again, it's a rookie wide receiver. We don't know. Anthony Schwartz did nothing in his rookie season. David Njoku was a factory of efficiency last year. If you look at all tight ends with 10 or more slot targets, and I think he could get some more slot time this year. Seventh in yards per route run, seventh in yards after catch per reception, and if you just look overall... 11th in yards per route run, and he was top five in yards after catch per reception. As a guy, we're looking for, okay, what checks the boxes on tight ends that blow up and come out of nowhere, out of the woodwork, and have like these top three, top five ceilings? Okay, um, they're athletic as hell. Okay, check for David Njoku. They have target volume that can be had. Check, check for David Njoku, considering all the other people around him. And... He's going for basically pennies right now and the ceiling outcome. And now he's going to be tied to Deshaun Watson instead of Baker Mayfield. And he could be the number two option in this passing attack. Hell, he could try, he could honestly rival Amari Cooper for targets on a weekly basis, considering what he's done in efficiency over the last few years. And it would not honestly surprise me because Amari Cooper's not, never been a guy that's garnered this 30% target share, 28% target share. So if we're looking for, okay, if targets are earned and they're earned based off of efficiency and getting open, I think David Njoku has a massive ceiling to do that this year. Let's have a conversation about approach then. So you've got him at tight end eight. 
He's tight end 16 in the ranking. So like you said, he's free square. Now I understand liking a player, but you're not drafting him necessarily at the same sort of overall impact of a tight end eight, correct? I just want to make that clear for everybody out there. You're looking at Njoku as a guy that you're going to wait to like the first 12 tight ends are off the board and then take Njoku or are you somebody that feels like, no, I want to be early and make sure that I get him. I just want to be clear of your approach with Njoku and best ball. No, I think right now in best ball, you look at the various sites you're going to be drafting on and you say, okay, here's the ADP of where he's going. If you look at my ranks and you look at all of our ranks over fantasy pros, players that we are above and below consensus on. Okay. That's going to put us in a lot of, I'm not saying that you have to draft him 88th overall, but if you look at whatever said site you're on and you say, okay, dear Lord, he's, he's 140th overall. He's 130th. Okay. I'm going to take him around or around and a half before ADP. Then you're still going to be above consensus. And I'm not telling you to draft him in the seventh or eighth round, you're still going to get a lot of David and Joku exposure. And when you look at our ranks, those are the players and how we rank them. I want you to be, when you look at this versus the ADPs on sites, you're automatically going to get more exposure. And I'm not telling you to draft him in the top hundred players. All right, let's go back to you for one more riser and Andrew Erickson. I got to tell you the name you threw out there on this list. You spent 10 weeks last week, last year with me burying this player. (laughs) Just burying him. You buried him and then like Ruth Langmore and Ozark built a pool over him. And I'm and somehow you have busted through the water, busted through the concrete and you've dug this player up. And I got to know why. Yeah. So uh, you're referring to Green Bay Packers tight end Robert Tanyan, who I famously, Mm -hmm. yes, like you had alluded to. I just I buried him every single time I was on the Fantasy Pros football podcast. Any chance I got, I was like, I can't start this guy. (laughs) Sit him. He's trash, whatever. But hey. New year, new me, and now I'm in on Robert Tanya because the the price <laughs> the price has changed. So he's no longer a top ten tight end by consensus. You don't need to draft him within the top ten rounds, and that was always my biggest issue with Tanya. It was this guy's going in the middle range of tight ends where you just don't see any return at the position, and you notice that guys that get drafted as tight end eight, nine, ten, eleven put up the same production basically as the guys you get at tight end 16, 17, 18, 19. Mm-hmm. So that's why I like Tanyan here where he has at where he is at tight end 16. So he's right at the beginning of that tier that I now look for when I'm drafting late round tight ends. And it's because the reason I was concerned about Tanyan last year is because there was just no targets for him in this offense because of Devontae Adams, just having a stranglehold on all of the targets in the offense and Tanya now has a chance like we're trying to debate between all these receivers and kind of goes back to my Lazard point and I could be wrong about Lazard and if Lazard doesn't emerge as the red zone guy then chances are could be Robert Tanya who is just one year removed from an 11 touchdown season in 2020 so I, I'm looking for the chemistry like yes the Packers added a bunch of different veteran guys off the street like do we really expect Aaron Rodgers to just develop this sick chemistry with Sammy Watkins. I mean, week one, he's probably going to blow up like Sammy Watkins always does. And we're all going to fall into the trap, Sammy Watkins. But Tanyan has the proven rapport and he plays tight end. So it's a little bit different than even trying to latch on one of the receivers. It's like, hey, I'm looking for a tight end with touchdown upside. Rodgers is probably going to throw 30, 35 touchdowns next year. If he does that, like who's going to catch them? Good bet on Robert Tanyan being that guy. So I think that his price now makes me want to be in on him. And that's the kind of a, a main takeaway message here is like, yes, I didn't like Robert Tanyan because of the price and his usage last year. Mm-hmm. When now I'm seeing a, a path where he can emerge and be different than he was last year before his injury. I have marked myself safe from Sammy Watkins for many years <laughs> by not drafting him. Uh, and I, and I want to push everyone else. Please do the same. Mark yourself safe from Sammy Watkins. Let's move to the other side of the spectrum. So those were guys that we like that are rising up the charts, but not everybody has a great story. Some guys are falling in the other direction. Derek Brown, let's go back to you and start with somebody that you've had to knock down a few pegs and take down in your rankings for best ball this year. Ranked him aggressively last year, and I'm not doing that this year. Kyler Murray, I am below consensus on. Uh, ECR has him at QB5. I have him at QB eight. So still in the QB one conversation, but he's 59th overall in our ACR. I have it, have him at 78th. So you're probably, if you're following my rankings, you're probably not going to get a lot of Kyler Murray. And the reasons are is DeAndre Hopkins is missing six freaking games. And we all know the splits. This is massive. And 
Look, you have Kyler Murray, who was a QB six last year with Hopkins on the field, completing 72% of his passes, 8.8 yards per attempt. And without Hopkins, it was disastrous. QB 16 completion rate dropped to 65 and his yards per attempt dropped to 6.7. Now, yes, he ran a little bit. Well, I'm not going to say he ran even more. Like if you look at those splits, he ran with Hopkins 6.1 times per game versus 6.5. He was just more effective in doing it. But I don't think he still didn't have enough rushing production on the ground to account for the dip that we saw last year. And rolling into this year, I think a lot of people are going to say, okay, let's move that over to Marquise Brown. Kyler Murray is not going to maybe see that big of a dip, but it's still a lot of projection. And Marquise Brown has never been a wide receiver that is going to just be an alpha in an offense and he can beat man press religiously. And he's a guy that can carry the offense in the same type of vein that Deandre Hopkins can. So I think that's a lot to put on Marquise Brown and to expect the same type of production or effectiveness, considering the massive splits we've seen for Kyler Murray, whether it's been Hopkins or injuries over the last two seasons. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just shy away from Kyler Murray and just take Jalen Hurts later. Give me all that action. Well, it's funny because Hurts is actually QB six, Kyler Murray QB five in the ECR and best ball right now. And uh, I'm actually with you. I would feel better about taking Jalen Hurts and what a difference a year makes. So new year, new Joey P also when it comes to Jalen Hurts. But I'm with you. I, I knocked him down even in my regular season rankings for Kyler Murray because I, I I was like you. I was aggressive last year. I thought we were trending towards something special and then the Hopkins injury and some of the other issues that have gone on. It seems like we've seen him in the organization. It's just a lot of stuff going on right now. And it just feels like a negative situation. And in terms of investments, the upside might be limited, which is a little scary to think about. All right, Andrew Erickson, who's scary to think about for you, a quarterback in terms of best ball rankings. I'm going to go with San Francisco 49ers quarterback, Trey Lance, because, and this isn't even really how I view Trey Lance. It's the market. Like the market has soured on Trey Lance since the pre-draft best ball season where he was going round six, where people were, he's locked and loaded. He's the guy, he's going to be the starter. And, you know, a few months later, Jimmy Garoppolo is still on the team. The reports are coming out that he looks like crap at OTAs from this, from beat reporters. So there's a bunch of ambiguity. And I just see this as an opportunity to buy. Like, I I really don't care because every time I've listened to off-season reports about this and that, uh, it just, it blows up my face. Like, I I want to take advantage when people are scared. Uh, When there's blood in the streets, I'm, I'm in. Like, that's what I want to be in on with Trey Lance because I've seen the upside with him. We really? You're a blood year. in the streets kind of guy, Erickson? I never, <laughs> it's such a squeaky clean image and you see your Twitter picture. Not when it comes to best ball. On. Not when it comes right. to best ball. This, this is, I'm out for blood when it comes to best ball. But <laughs> I think that, because that's the only reason he's falling in, in best ball drafts is because of reports. No one, but we don't, we're not there. Like, we're not seeing him. So he's not a faller for you. Yes. He's a faller that you want to take advantage of, just Correct. to be clear. That's yes. the statement. That, that, okay. Yeah, I wanted to be clear on that because you know, we are talking fallers and, and risers here. And, and Trey Lance was a guy when I – or on Fantasy Pros, I wrote up an article basically just identifying the biggest fallers and risers post-draft. And Trey Lance was the biggest quarterback faller, like by far. And it's just weird because they didn't – I'm kind of trying to find peace between like why is this happening? And it's because of just reports. Like – Mm-hmm. And what's the credibility of those reports? Like, okay, I, I I believe Trey Sermon was the backup last year. That didn't work out. Like, so so why are we all just jumping to conclusions that Trey Lance is now not going to be the starter? Garoppolo is going to be the guy when you can look at it as, okay, Garoppolo is coming off shoulder surgery. They can't trade him. The minute that a quarterback goes down, a starting quarterback, okay, who's going to be the first guy to get traded? Probably Jimmy Garoppolo or Baker Mayfield. So I think that there's so many scenarios where in a month from now, we're talking about, oh yeah, Trey Lance is the starter. And now his ADP is back up. So it's like, I'm going to take advantage now, get him out of value now, and then I can fade him in later best ball drafts when he is back to where his price should be. So that's my spiel on Trey Lance. I remember reports last year about Jamar Chase having trouble seeing and catching the NFL size football. (laughs) I remember those reports. Those did not work out. Well, well, they worked out for me because again, yes, exactly. (laughs) Depends on how you depends on who's working out for who. (laughs) <laughs> we'll figure it out. All right, D. Bro, let's go back to you for another guy who might be falling in the best ball ranks for you. Oh man, this um, this one's tough because I love the player and I still have him inside my top twelve running backs, but I'm not going to end up with a lot of him this year, considering 
Austin Eckler is going right now as ECR RB3. Third overall is where people have him ranked. I have him as RB10 and 17th overall, and a lot of this comes down to the landing spot for Isaiah Spiller. I think that this team has wanted a running mate for Austin Eckler over the last few seasons, and we talked about this on the rookie episode. I'm high, and I've got him in uh, inside of my top 36 running backs for Isaiah Spiller because I think that they're going to share this load more than we saw last year. Austin Eckler was 10th in opportunity share and third in weighted opportunity. Like, this is a guy that uh, he was second red zone rushing attempts. If we see that, like, that's not a whole lot of room for growth. So uh, pick your poison here. If you don't believe it's Isaiah Spiller, if the Chargers throw more when they get inside the 20, and I and Austin Eckler's not part of that, he's not getting as many targets because also he was 24th in red zone targets last year. If that drops, you know, whether it's Isaiah Spiller, or Josh Palmer takes a step forward, a lot of different scenarios where I think Austin Eckler is going to have a tough time paying off on this. And I'm not going to chase last year's results. Why I think he's still going to be an effective player, and I still have him ranked as a top 12 running back. I'm not going to end up with a lot of him because I think that there's some variance in range of outcomes here. All right. So you've got him as RB 10 consensus has him at three. Uh, what about Spiller? Is that actually a guy that you would look to draft in best ball for the opportunity of, well, if Eckler does miss some time or has an injury, the Spiller could potentially fill a full-time role. I have so much Isaiah Spiller and Dynasty, it's going to bleed right over into best ball season. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of exposure to Isaiah Spiller, especially if you're looking at zero running back builds where you're going to lean heavily into wide receivers. If Austin Eckler won, or you go hero RB, and you you pay up for the one guy, and you're looking just trying to fill a spot, I think Isaiah Spiller is going to walk into a few ceiling weeks. He's going to maybe have a few what, two touchdown games inside of a top five offense Mm -hmm. in the NFL. And if Eckler goes down, we would be ranking Isaiah Spiller as a top five to 10 running back on a weekly basis. See, I, when you say hero running back to me, it's like a three person band. It's like, to me, it's, it's Taylor, it's Derrick Henry. And I can, I can stomach Dalvin cook. I can, that's it. Those are my three that I'm like, well, if you're going hero, the rest of the guys, I find them hard to invest in that strategy with for a myriad of reasons so it's a fascinating conversation i can't wait till we get into some draft season stuff and we start to really look at the different strategies and how that all works itself out who is not working out for you in best ball who's who's falling and going the other direction here andrew erickson antonio gibson for the washington commanders and it just the, the off season has not gone the way that anyone that's a gibson supporter or a gibson truther would have i likely idealized because it's like jd mckissick is back in the lineup and now you add brian robinson the the rookie rookie running back from alabama that they drafted in the third round and you're just looking at the splits with mckissick in the lineup last year gibson was rb 23 he was rb 9 when mckissick was out so like that's the path we're like all right here we go like mckissick is down with buffalo wheels up for gibson oh no mckissick's back this sucks okay like still like rb2 and then just adding another running back to the fold uh, and Brian Robinson. And look, you can think that Brian Robinson's not a good running back or he's just average, but clearly the Washington team thinks that he has some talent or else they wouldn't have taken him in the third round. So I think that he's probably going to play. We've already heard Ron Rivera talk about how he wants to mimic a D'Angelo Williams, Jonathan Stewart type of backfield. So mm-hmm. I think it's an attempt to try to keep Gibson healthy over the long run. We obviously saw Gibson deal with a lingering injury last year. They really, and they really never could afford to sit him and get him healthy. They didn't have any other mm. running backs that they could use. So they had to keep playing Gibson when he was less than hundred percent. So I just, I don't know if we're going to see Gibson get 300 touches again. Like that's what he had last year. He was ranked fourth in the NFL in touches. I, I just don't think we're going to get that in his ECR at RB 18. That's the same as his fantasy points per game finish was last year at RB 18. So right now people are gauging him like, it's like the same as last year when it's not like it's worse than it was last year. Now you could argue, okay, you know, with Wentz, maybe the offense is better. I still think Wentz is an upgrade, but you know, trying to always parse between like, okay, like this guy's going to get all the touchdowns can sometimes lead to, you know, poor analysis and kind of like getting left out. So Gibson, I just have concerns about as a guy that back end RB two, where I just don't know if that top tier upside is there with him with all the other pieces in that backfield. See, this is a player that when I get lower into this range where I'm looking at him, Dobbins coming back from an injury, ATN coming back from an injury, Gibson's the one guy I feel like we've seen it. 
he can do it. We've seen it more than once, too. We saw it in the second half of 2020. We saw it in the second half of 2021. And you're right. I mean, the, where he finished is right outside on that bubble of, of RB1. But the second half, he was clearly an RB1 from the stats. And I know Ron Rivera said that, and I think everybody's freaking out about the whole duo running back thing. If there's one guy in best ball, I feel like for me, when I get a little bit lower into that running back pool, that I would circle and say, can he break RB1 territory? See, to me, that's the guy that can. That's the guy that I really feel like could do it. So I understand why he's falling, but this is a guy for me that I would I would catch and I would put him on my roster. Derek, how do you feel about Antonio Gibson? Because I think this is going to be one of these guys that's very divisive, and I'd love to hear your take on him. Um, I'm gonna just going to go out on a limb here and say he is not Derrickson approved. Um, I am lower mm. on Gibson as well. Wow. Um it's because Gibson has legit put the ball on the turf religiously. Like he's tied with Ezekiel Elliott for the most fumbles um, over the last season or last two seasons. Yeah, it's the last two seasons since he's been the primary rusher. And I just, whereas I, I was last year, and this is not about me being burned by Antonio Gibson. I was all in. Like I had massive exposure to him in best ball. But this year, I think the team is telling us from all these different moves, he's capped. Um, whether you want to talk about who puts the ball on the turf and Brian Robinson comes in and steals goal line work, we know he's not getting pass routes because J.D. McKissick is going to be garnering those. So it's a guy, if, if I'm in that range and I'm on the clock and I can't take a wide receiver and I'm looking at running backs in that range, I've actually started gravitating more to Travis Etienne in that range because he has the pass catching chops. We saw that in college. James Robinson, we don't know where he's at in his rehab or if he's going to come back with the same type of juice and he's competing with what Snoop Connor for goal line work. So if, if anything, I'm going to fade old Doug Peterson narratives and I'll, I'll take ETN there uh, in that range over Antonio Gibson. Joe, All right. would you, Joe, yes. would you rather have Antonio Gibson or David Montgomery? Oh, I'd rather have Antonio mm. Gibson. There's no hesitation there for me. See, I don't see a David world in that. Uh, see, I don't see a world when that offense with Chicago that they are going to make any leaps and bounds. Whereas what? I think with with Carson Wentz as a quarterback under center, I'm not saying Carson Wentz is great. I'm saying he is a quarterback in the NFL, and that's one thing. Like Justin Fields still has a lot to prove to me in that regard. I'm not saying he can't get there, but I've seen it, and I'm making an early investment in best ball. I'm going to make investments in what I know. And I know what Carson Wentz is, for better or worse. And I know he's an upgrade over what they had with Heineke. And we can all sit here all day on a whole podcast and talk about all the deficiencies of Wentz because there's plenty. But there's also positives and there's some things that he can do better than what's been done recently at the quarterback position there in Washington. So that's that's how I feel about Gibson. And I, you know what's perplexing to you guys is that Gibson being a wide receiver in college doesn't get the passing work. And, and if I don't know why that doesn't transition. I don't know why they haven't made that a thing for him. But that's what's so upsetting to me. I'm, I'm going to listen to Ron Rivera's thing about, yeah, I want to go back to that sort of D'Angelo Williams, Jonathan Stewart backfield thing. I'll believe it when I see it. Right now, I still think it's Antonio Gibson's backfield, and then I, we'll see what happens here. So this is fun. I like the debate. Let's get to two more guys here. Derek Brown, give me two other guys that you think are moving in the wrong direction in your ranks or maybe in the public ranks for one reason or another when it comes to best ball drafts. I am not buying in. Well, I'm buying into range of outcomes more uh, with Elijah <laughs> Mitchell. Um, put okay. it that way. I'm not buying into him. People have right now. He is ECR. He's a top 24 running back 58th overall. I have him at 74th and at RB 28. I think the team mm -hmm. is trying to tell us something. Uh, you look at Elijah Mitchell. He was third in opportunity share. He gobbled up all the work last year and 13th and snap share, but he wasn't effective with this. Like, you're looking at a guy that was 29th in evaded tackles, 34th outside the top 30 in yards created per touch and breakaway run rate. That's not good from an efficiency standpoint, and he wasn't getting high-value touches. He was 31st in weighted opportunity. So if the snaps and the volume go down, at least at all, like if we see them split up more of the backfield work, or they... Come to it comes to fruition that what they told us in the NFL draft, like, okay, well, maybe Trey Sermon is not that guy, obviously. They still spent a third round pick on Tyrion Davis Price. And regardless of whatever our thoughts were coming into the draft cycle, we have to adjust to what the team is telling us. And people are like, well, Elijah Mitchell did so much last year. And I was like, okay, well, but his efficiency wasn't great. And the team went out in this offseason and instead of doubling down and saying, yeah, Mitchell's our guy, they went and drafted a running back in the third round. Eh. 
pass. Y'all have that fun. All right. So you got Eli Mitchell. Uh, who's another guy for you, Derek, that you have going in the opposite direction? It's Dawson Knox. I, I I don't like the the cost that you're you're chasing touchdowns from last year. He's tied for the most right. touchdown receptions uh, at the tight end position. But this is also we have a changing of the guard. Cole Beasley got he just X'd out of the offense last year. And now we see they brought in Jamison Crowder, Khalil Shakir, and James Cook, who all can eat up targets underneath. I think mm-hmm. Dawson Knox, you're just you're chasing. You're chasing last year's outlier production for a guy that was also fourth in red zone targets amongst tight ends. There's not a lot of room for growth there. So no, you can miss me with Dawson Knox in drafts. I have him outside my top. 12 guys and I'm a good uh, about round and a half overall behind where ECR is for Dawson Knox. It reminds me a little bit of Austin Hooper a couple years ago, right? He had that great year with the Falcons, but it was all, you know, clearly where it was in that moment with the red zone targets. And then when that went away, the rest is history. All right, Erickson, give us another couple names that you think are falling in the ranks and rightfully so in best ball drafts. So Michael Thomas wide receiver for the New Orleans saints is Look, I just I I need some clarification with whether he's healthy or not before I'm going to invest. You know, around. <laughs> well, it's picks. been two years. Like, I'm still waiting too. I think we're like, all waiting. Derek, yeah. did you did you talk to Michael Thomas? Did you hear anything from him yet? I've sent some no. DMs. I haven't gotten replies um, on that. But I'll keep checking Instagram <laughs> to see if there's any updates on his profile or my DMs. There probably won't be. Yeah, yeah. Hold yeah, on. I just I find myself when I'm drafting, you know, in the middle rounds, like that's where I really want to pound wide receivers. Like I really want to draft and target receivers I think can make a, a big leap in 2022. And Michael Thomas is kind of in that tier, at least ADP wise in ECR. But I'm just like, I, I find myself gravitating and finding other receivers to pick instead of Michael Thomas because I have concerns about, okay, is he healthy? They just signed Jarvis Landry. Okay, what does that mean? Is, is Jarvis Landry depth? Does that mean like, hey, just in case Michael Thomas isn't healthy, we have another guy that we can plug in that can soak up targets in this passing attack. I, I just don't know. And, and that's why it's, you just, with these guys that have these injury ambiguity, we need to get them at discounts. Like they need to come cheap. It has to be like, priced in and if it's not i'm gonna shy away probably more than paying up for a player that has red flags like it's clear red flag for michael thomas that we just really haven't seen him yet and the latest report was that he still has hurdles to climb or to to get over before he's ready to go and adding more wide receivers isn't the same like it's not the same situation michael thomas is going back into it's not drew Brees. it's not he's the only guy in the offense like there are guys that i mean jarvis landry can command targets like and so can chris olave so I think mm-hmm. that Michael Thomas is someone I had to bump down a little bit. And it's not like mean that I'm out on him. Push this guy up um, the ADP boards. So that's m- my ride receiver. And then the tight end is Logan Thomas for the Washington Commanders. And basically, he's falling in drafts because for similar reasons, the injury. But kind of on the other side of the coin, I like Logan Thomas because he's becoming really, really cheap because of his injury. So he's not a guy you have to pay a fifth round pick for like Michael Thomas. Logan Thomas or Logan Thomas is going outside the top 10 rounds, but he's a tight end with the pedigree. He was top. He was 11th in fantasy points per game last year when he was healthy. He's finished as a tight end one before. And you have Carson Wentz, that type of Zach Ertz corollary, where if Zach or mm-hmm. if Carson Wentz kind of identifies Logan Thomas as his like new Zach Ertz. Okay. Boom. Like you can see Logan Thomas getting a lot of targets in this Washington sure. offense. So he's, He's a player where the injury is baked in and he is super cheap because of it. So if he comes back from his ACL injury, then I think that Logan Thomas would be a value. Yeah, I like the Logan Thomas thing. You know, the Michael Thomas one so far, what I've seen, I had a best ball draft this last week and I got Michael Thomas as my third wide receiver. And I love that in best ball. You give me Michael Thomas as my third. wide. I think I had Jamar Chase, Debo Samuel, my first two picks. And then I got Michael Thomas later as my third guy as my third guy in best ball. There's so much upside there in redraft. I can understand all the concerns we might have, but this is early and taking shots early is uh, what we're trying to do here. So we hope everybody likes all this information that we've given out to you today. And if you need more of it, well, I got a place where I can send you. How about fantasypros.com? That's right, because we've got the best ball draft kit up there. And of course, we've got all these rankings out there as well. But if you want to get this best ball draft kit, it's free at fantasypros.com slash best ball. Again, it's got all the stuff we're talking about here articles, roster construction, advice, uh, suggestions about who to target, all the ADP stuff, everything you could possibly imagine. And if you're a premium subscriber to Fantasy Pros, well, guess what? You get even more access to more outstanding information. And then when you hurl that 
premium subscription over into our Discord. You get access to talk about your best ball drafts. You can say, hey, D-Bro, who am I going to pick with this next guy, uh, this next pick that I got? And then Derek Brown can message you back. It's amazing the access you can get, but you have to be a premium member. So go check it out for free and see what you like over at fantasypros.com slash chat. That's the place to go. And uh, once again, if you head over to Fantasy Pros for the rankings that we've got here, that's where you can see all these best ball rankings at fantasypros.com slash rankings and then tap the little best ball ranking section and you can see all the glory in front of you right at your fingertips. That'll do it for us, but the story of the game goes on. For Derrickson, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.